Amen. All right, tonight we come back to the book of Daniel. We are in Daniel chapter 8. If you'd turn there in your copy of God's Word, Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 to 27. Last week, as we finished Daniel 7, we looked at an overview of the end. And in that, chapter 7 was an overview chapter of the rest of the prophetic section of verses 8 through 12. And that's just like chapter 2 was an overview of chapters 3 through 6. Both chapters gave us a full overview of the prophetic events from Daniel's time to the end of time. Chapters 2 through 6 were from a historic perspective looking at the elements of the past with respect to Daniel's life. Even though the vision of chapter 2 foretold Christ's messianic kingdom, it was only hinted at in that section. The perspectives of the chapters came from the point of view of a a pagan king who at least initially was unbelieving. And the question, of course, arises, did Nebuchadnezzar come to saving faith in chapter 4? And I think there's a strong likelihood that that can be answered in the affirmative. But we'll know one day when we are with him. Because of this, the section was written in Aramaic. That is because it was focusing on the pagan kings of that time and their domination over Israel. Chapter 7 also was written in Aramaic, as I mentioned to you, because it is a transition chapter. Because it focuses on the Gentile world powers that dominate Israel. But it does so primarily from a prophetic point of view. One vital aspect to remember is the strict chronology that Daniel is written in. That there are strict elements of chapters 1 to 6 that are specifically orchestrated in time. And so also chapters 7 to 12, the events specifically orchestrated in time. However, there is a bit of overlap that occurs because chapters 7 and 8 back up and are chronologically placed prior to Daniel chapter 5. And we'll see more of that this evening. But we recognize that Daniel's strict chronology is such an important understanding, particularly in chapter 7. Verses 1 to 14 are given to us exactly as the rest of the book is, following a very specific, very strict chronological presentation. This is so important for us to understand because when we do, we realize that the presentation and coronation of Jesus Christ as Messiah reigning on his earthly throne in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7 does not happen until after the destruction of Antichrist in verses 11 to 12 which we know from Revelation, occurs at the end of that book. That's such an important understanding for us because that element shows that the, it negates the entire covenant theology timeline that says that Christ is now reigning on his throne. Well, they see that throne not as an earthly throne, but as a heavenly one, But the problem is not only is there no indication of Scripture that David's throne is in heaven, rather it is David's throne and it is on earth. But more importantly, again, the chronology of Daniel tells us that he will not reign, Christ will not reign on that throne until Antichrist is removed. So it is yet still future. And this really tears apart all of the theological timeline of covenant theology. And you can go back and refresh yourselves on all of those messages and all of those various details. Chapter 8 then takes us back to the Hebrew section of that text. And I just want to say a brief hallelujah. Because I can translate Hebrew text about 7 to 10 verses an hour. I can translate Aramaic about two to three verses an hour. So to be past that section is a blessing beyond measure. 
but it has been a joy to get to do that, and I'm excited to be back in the Hebrew. But it is important for us to understand this Hebrew, and the, and the reason that it transitions back to this is two primary reasons. One, because our perspectives now come from a godly man, from Daniel, a Jewish man writing in his native tongue about the events that are being shown to him in a prophetic fashion. And we'll see this repeatedly in the coming chapters. That is the nature of Daniel as an incredibly godly man. We've already seen it, but we will see so much more. The second point is because now the focus changes you remember in the first section, it was focusing on the Gentile rulers that dominated Israel. Now our focus in this Hebrew section, beginning in chapter 8 and to the end of the book, focuses on the ultimate fate of the nation of Israel. Therein again, appropriate that the language transitions from Aramaic to Hebrew. So we move from chapter 7's overview of the end to chapter 8, which I've titled The Beginning of the End. The Beginning of the End. And in our text today, our theme is four facets that allude to the arrival of the end. We'll have four points in our message, and they each allude to this arrival, this introduction to the end times. Very, very exciting for us because the text we'll cover tonight is actually historic from our point of view. And remember what we mentioned earlier about that overlap in chronology. You'll see that as we dive into our discussion tonight. And with that, let's go to our first point, which I have titled the announcement the announcement in verses 1 to 2. Look at verses 1 to 2 of chapter 8 with me in your copy of God's Word. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam, and I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. So, in this first point, the announcement, verse 1 sets our time frame as the third year of Belshazzar. As I've previously mentioned, that puts Daniel chapter 8, and like it, Daniel 7 before, prior to chapter 5 of Daniel. Because chapter 5 of Daniel is effectively the last day or days perhaps, maybe a couple days in that chapter, of Belshazzar. It is the end of the Babylonian kingdom. So these chapters happen immediately prior to that in strict time chronology. But keep in mind that although there is that overlap, chapter 7 all the way through the end is a chronological presentation. So we see that, uh, that this vision then is two years after chapter 7. Like chapter 7, Daniel is emphatic in verse 1 that it is his vision. And literally in the Hebrew text, we would translate this as, A vision was shown to me, I, Daniel. We saw that very same construction at the beginning of chapter 7, only in Aramaic. But again, a thrice repeated personal reference to Daniel. You can't get more reference, more, more emphatic that he is conveying to us his personal visions than the way that the text shows us in those words. And it is subsequent to the one previously given at the end of verse 1. Why does he tell us that? If we know that it's strictly chronological, and even if we didn't, that seems like somewhat of an extraneous point. Beloved, don't forget, there are no extraneous points in Scripture. So spend time trying to figure out what you see in all of these phrases. And the reason that we have this phrase, and that it is subsequent to the one previously, that it is, that it is following, or that it is consecutive, or sequential with the one previously, 
And it's literally translated, that last word in verse 1 previously is translated as at the beginning. You'll note that in footnote 2 in your New American Standard Bibles, that it shows us there that that phrase is literally at the beginning. So he's telling us that this vision is coming after, sequential to, chronologically after the previous one, and that it happened two years earlier. So Daniel has had two years to ponder the vision of chapter 7. Remember how chapter 7 ended, verse 28, let me read it. At this point, the revelation ended, as for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me. and My face grew pale, and I kept the matter to myself. So this this pallor, this, this deep concern that Daniel had is something that he ponders on for the next two years until this subsequent vision comes. So he's had this time to consider this, and it confirms for us that this vision builds on the previous one, as one commentator notes for us. Historically, we're at about 550 B.C., which is important as this is during the rise of the Media-Persia kingdom that will be alluded to in this chapter. In verse 2 then, Daniel sees himself in the fortress city of Susa. Remember where Daniel lived. He was in Babylon. Susa is a city that is about 250 miles to the southwest of Babylon. It is a city that, uh, well before we get to that city, let's just talk about what he's telling us as he's showing us in verse 2 that he looked in the vision and while he was looking I was in the city. He wasn't transported in the vision. He wasn't physically taken in the vision. That often happens in scripture. Think about Isaiah 6.1. Isaiah is before the king. Before the Lord of heaven. And he recognizes that he is a man of unclean lips. Amongst a people of unclean lips. And he is undone. And the seraphim takes a coal from underneath the altar. And touches his tongue. He is physically there. So also with Paul in 2 Corinthians 13. He is physically transported to the third heaven. We see also in Ezekiel. The aspect of physical transportation that occurs in these visions. Now, is it physical? Is it metaphysical? Uh, We're not going there. The book says that they are either there or that they're seeing it in a vision. Here, Daniel is seeing it. And Daniel is living again in Babylon in the vision, but what we find out about Susa is Susa will become the capital of Media Persia. But it isn't yet. Now this is super important because Susa is a very dominant city and it goes clear back before the Assyrians. It was, it's called here the Citadel of Susa, which can either mean a, a fortress inside a fortress. Basically this city was a huge, Susa was a huge fortress. However, there had been a breach of this fortress that had happened back just prior to Nebuchadnezzar, and Susa was destroyed. Susa was destroyed. Susa, at the time of Daniel's vision in 550 BC, has not as yet been rebuilt. But Daniel's vision is taking him to this city that is referred to as a citadel, as a a fortress, confirming that it will be rebuilt. And that's a very important understanding for us to understand. That which occurs, uh, at, at this destruction then that will come following this is that of Babylon at, uh, that happens at the end of chapter 5. So, as we think about this first point of our announcement, the time frame, the setting or any of these surrounding details that set us on this track, any questions? 
We have a Bible study here, so if you want to throw your hand up, it doesn't take much to stump me, and everyone loves that. Okay, well, it's important for us to realize all of those details because they set the scene for where we're going. And with that, with that then let's go to our second point, which I've titled The Illusion. The Illusion. Look at verses 3 and 4 with me. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power, but he did as he pleased and magnified himself. As we look into these verses and verse 3, if you've read ahead, and I know you're familiar with this book, you realize that this ram is a picture of Media Persia. Remember our discussion about the chronology of Daniel. Chapters 7 through 12 are strictly chronological. Chapter 7 was an overview now we're going to the beginning of the end, the beginning of the times that are yet future to Daniel's life. The exact chronology places chapters 7 and 8 before the final destruction of Babylon. So all that we're going to see here, starting with Media Persia, has as yet to occur. Some of it will begin very swiftly, but it's not yet. So this is the introduction to our prophetic section. And the depiction of the ram in verse 3, again, is representative of Media Persia, as we see definitively proclaimed in verse 20, where it says, verse 20 of chapter 8, the ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. This confirms that these two nations, Media and Persia, are one kingdom in Daniel 7's vision of the bear, and it necessitates the inclusion of Rome as the fourth kingdom. Why is that important? I've been telling you that for weeks. It's important because liberal commentators try to deny that Rome is the fourth kingdom in chapter 7. And instead, they say that media is one kingdom and Persia is one kingdom, as the first kingdom is Babylon, the second one they say is Media, the third is Persia, and the fourth is Greece. But we know that that's not the case from the text, and here, in verse 20, which I just read for you, it's confirmed. This demands that Rome be pulled in to the chapter 7 vision, and it again removes the errant interpretation of liberal commentators. The repeated theme of the animals from chapter 7, now in chapter 8, although different, is purposeful, as we'll see. The 4th century A.D. Roman historian confirms that the golden head of a ram was carried before the media Persian army everywhere that they went. Now this is before there was effectively a media Persian army. So this is prophetic down to the detail of this animal. But there's much more that's being brought in and there's much more significance. And we see that in our text, with the two horns of the ram, as they indicate the two nations, Media and Persia. Both are long, indicating great power. Both Media and Persia came to have great power. But one is longer, and that is the more powerful. And the longer one comes up afterwards. And as we've discussed, this perfectly fits the detail given to us all the way back in the vision, the dream of chapter 2 by Nebuchadnezzar. Remember the bear raised up on one leg? And that is that raised up portion on that side that was indica indicative of Persia, the more powerful empire. So also in Daniel chapter 7. So what we're seeing here is that this first horn is media. The second that came later and was longer and larger, had more power, was Persia. Persia. 
And historically, all of this, of course, perfectly bears out. So this element of, uh, of the empire is clear from these horns. And then in verse 4, the ram is budding in three directions, and none could stand before him. This budding, of course, as we know well, having the blessing of living in this great state. You know, my dad lived down the Salmon River for many, many years. And when you drive down that river road, there would even be rams butting heads on the dirt road. But we've all seen pictures of them, how they rear up and, you know, these massive thundering crashes together. Well, that's the depiction that we're seeing here. This is what we're seeing of the kingdom of Media Persia and all that they're doing. The directions are indicative of the recorded extra-biblical military conquests. We see in extra-biblical literature to the north that Media Persia conquered Turkey. We see that Media Persia conquered Babylon, which was to the west, as I just mentioned, southwest actually, and that Egypt was to the direct south. And we see the conquest of Egypt by Media Persia. And we've talked about that battle before in our previous discussions. So the vision continues with the next animal then in verse 5. Look at verse 5 with me. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him. And he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. The male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. And in its place, there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. So the vision again continues here with our animals. And verse 21 confirms for us that the goat represents Greece. The goat's direction from the west indicates where Greece was with respect to Media Persia the ram that it was coming to destroy. Again, proximately to the west. This is an important facet of, uh, facet of directions in our visions for you to pay attention to. Sometimes when we see visions and when we see visions in Revelation or Zechariah and we see here discussion of, of armies coming from the north, that somehow are connected with Antichrist, we start to wonder how far north, or at least I do. Recognize now that we have had two separate references in a couple of verses referencing west. One of them is referencing an area of only a couple hundred miles. The other one is representing an area of several thousand miles to the west. So when directions are given, don't start locking in and saying that it's going to be you know, way up north. We're talking about Siberia or at least Russia. Or, or for sure, maybe Turkey. Not necessarily. When it talks about areas to the north of Israel, it could be Samaria. Or it could be Lebanon. Any of these immediately north. So it's an important correlation for us to get our arms around in this specific example. And as we, we think about this, we're also told that he comes without touching the ground. This is indicating the incredible speed of Alexander the Great's conquest of the world. And we've again talked about that. He went so fast, it's as if his feet never touched the ground. And in a period of a very few years, he conquered the entire modern world. This is also a reminder of the winged leopard from chapter 7. And the speed that Alexander moved at. Verses 6 and 7 show Alexander the Great's violent attack and aggression against Media Persia. You'll remember that this battle 
between Greece and Media Persia began back in the book of Esther. In Esther. You remember King Artaxerxes from our discussion last year? And how he had the big powwow with all of the princes where the queen was brought in in this drunken orgy situation and she wouldn't go. Vashti said, no, I'm having none of it. The purpose of that gathering was to prepare to make war against Greece. Xerxes' father, Darius, had tried to make war with Greece and although massively outnumbering the Greek army, failed and was defeated. By the way, Xerxes did the same thing and also was defeated by the Greeks despite massive military might both on land and at sea. But the Greeks prevailed. However, Media Persia was successful in looting and destroying great parts of Athens. And the Greeks never forgot it. When Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedonia, was king, he was preparing to exact vengeance on Media Persia for their attacks and for their destruction of Athens. He died suddenly. Alexander the Great takes the throne and he says, boys, we're going in and we are going in hard. And he goes after the armies of Media Persia with all of his, his zeal. And so we see that in these verses. And at the end of verse 6, we see a horn arise, again a symbol of power. Verse 21 shows us that the horn is the first king of the empire. And I want you to listen to Paul Tanner's excellent description of what happened from a historic point of view that fulfills Daniel's future prophecy. This from Paul Tanner's commentary on Daniel. He begins in discussing verse 6 of chapter 8. These verses depict Alexander's clash with the Persian armies. Verse 7 notes that being infuriated at Persia, he went against her in the fury of his strength. The Greeks had long been embittered against Persia since the early 5th century BC. Both Darius and his son Xerxes had made military assaults on Greece, yet the Persians suffered defeats at the hands of the Greeks at the Battle of Marathon, 490, and the Battle of Salamis, 480. Even though the far outnumbered Greeks had been able to repulse the Persian army and navy, Persia managed to loot and destroy Athens, a bitter pill, as it were, that the Greeks had never forgotten. Alexander's father, Philip II, had stirred up his generation to overthrow the Persian Empire. And upon his unexpected death, Alexander readily stepped in to lead the charge. He left Greece in the spring of 334 BC at the mere age of 23 years old with a relatively small army, vastly inferior to the size of the Persians. In some of the most surprising but yet incredibly brilliant military maneuvers, he managed to pull off a series of upsets against the Persian forces that vastly outnumbered him. These were four. First, May 334 BC. Alexander pushes into Asia Minor and defeats the Persian forces at the Granicus River near modern-day Ergli in northern Turkey. October 333 BC, Alexander defeats the great Persian army of 600,000 footmen at the Battle of Isis near the, near the northeastern tip of the Mediterranean Sea. This time the Persian army was led by King Darius II himself, though he managed to escape and face Alexander later at Guagamala. 332 BC, Alexander invaded Egypt after a costly victory at Tyre, by the way, which is proclaimed prophetically in Isaiah, and was readily welcomed as the liberator in Egypt. The Egyptians hated the Persians. With his rear position protected, he was now free to attack Darius directly. October 331 BC, in a final showdown, Alexander dis decisively defeats the Persians at Guagamela near Arabella in Assyria, just east of the ancient site of Nineveh. Darius 
The third fled in retreat but was soon killed. Alexander was then free to march into Babylon and subsequently into Susa and Persopolis. Alexander's final defeat of Persia at Guagamala is probably what the latter part of Daniel 8, 7 depicts. Then he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him and there was no one to deliver the ram from his power, end quote. A time frame of three years and a tiny army, Alexander destroys the ruthless media Persians. Fascinating for us to understand this. Verse 8 reveals Alexander the Great's extreme pride, even proclaiming himself as a god to be worshipped. The horn is then broken without explanation as indicative of divine judgment. Alexander the Great's death at 33 years old, only 10 years after he began his world conquest, was from alcohol poisoning, or so most presume. He had no successor, and his non-Macedonian wife was hated by the Grecian world, and she was assassinated while pregnant, leaving no heir. Thirty years of internal wars and assassinations in ensued until the kingdom was broken up into four parts indicated by the four horns of verse 8. Verses 9 to 14 continue the description of the goat of Greece where it says, out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to earth, and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. And it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? While the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Now in verse 9, we're introduced to the small horn. This is not, note, not the same small horn from chapter 7. But there are purposeful repetitions of terms. The small horn emerges here from the four horns of Greece, the third beast of chapter 7. Chapter 7's little horn emerges from the fourth beast from Rome and from the latter or the second appearance of that kingdom. And that second manifestation of the Roman Empire at the end times, which we have discussed and know as Antichrist. But again, there are important parallels, specifically the terminology. Although different as mentioned, the terms, they're, un, they're similar, although the beasts are unlike one another. So we recognize that these parallels are on purpose, and we'll see much more of that as we go along. This small horn is Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, who reigned from 175 to 164 BC. He is a descendant of the Seleucid dynasty. One of the four horns, one of the four kingdoms that Greece was eventually broken into from verse 8. His conquest to the south is into Egypt over one of his rival sections, the Ptolemaic dynasty. Another of the four horns. 
we've talked about these four different generals when we were going through chapter 7. He went east into Armenia and to Parthia. And importantly, into the beautiful land, which is Israel. Daniel 11.41 uses the identical term, the beautiful land. In verse 10, the term host of heaven is often misunderstood. And it is best to be recognized as a spiritual representation of Israel, just referenced in verse 8. In 17 of the 18 times that this term, host of heaven, appears in the scripture, it is related to the stars, to the stars in the heavens. And in two very important areas specifically, and others, the term host of heaven or stars is a symbolic representation of the nation of Israel. Where? Genesis chapter 15 in the Abrahamic covenant. As Abraham asked, how will I have a descendant since I have no heir and the heir in my home is one from another? And what does God say? Look to the stars of the heaven if you can count them. The stars are a symbolic representation of what the nation of Israel will become. Where else do we see it? Several places, but most specifically, we see it also in Genesis chapter 37 and verse 9, where Joseph has a dream and the stars bow down to him and the moon and the sun, representing the 12 tribes or the 11 tribes as well as his mother and father. So stars are a symbolic reference to the people of Israel, and so it is here. The further falling and trampling of these stars depicts Antiochus' treachery and destruction towards the people of Israel. That same verb trampled is used in verse 7 uh, the, of the goat, further confirming this parallel understanding of human kings trampling on other human beings. And so it is here. The growing up or exalting was Antiochus, Antiochus is portraying himself as God and going into the temple in Jerusalem to offer sacrifices and desecrating the temple and again proclaiming himself to be God. More on this in just a few moments. Verse 11, the magnification uh, that occurs there, the, um, the exaltation as he magnifies himself equal with the commander of hosts is also could be translated as prince of hosts, commander of hosts or prince of hosts. And from the parallel usage of that term prince, same Hebrew word in verse 25, we recognize that this is God. He is exalting himself equal with God. Exactly what we just spoke about. He also stops the temple sacrifices and desecrates the sanctuary by sacrificing pigs, unclean animals, and showering the holy place, all of the holy vessels, the table of showbread, the lampstand, the golden altar with pig's blood and goes into the holy of holies and covers it in pig's blood. He also set up an idol in the temple and he built an altar on which to sacrifice to those idols. In verse 12, the transgressions that are referenced there are those of the host, the host of heaven, the stars of Israel. Well, what did Israel do? Haven't they finally gotten it together? Well, we know the answer to that because they still haven't gotten it together. But one day, but what they had done historically is very clearly detailed. You see, what we find out is that the Jews violently disliked the high priest Ananias III. And they used funds from the temple treasury to bribe Antiochus. And after they had bribed him, they assassinated Ananias. And another Jew, Menelaus, who had no right 
or legitimate claim to the title of priesthood used that temple money to bribe Antiochus to receive the high priesthood. The sins of the saints, the sins of the holy ones, the transgressions that are described here of the host of Israel were their destruction of the priesthood. And they're allowing, effectively, the desecration of the temple through this assassination and through this purchase of the priesthood. And by the way, the priesthood never returned to the Aaronic lineage to the time of Christ with with Annas and Caiaphas, also illegitimate heirs to the priesthood. And this was indeed the end of the Aaronic line. These were the transgressions for which they and the Israelites were allowed to be disposed of. And the flinging of the truth to the ground was the destruction of the Torah. Antiochus took anyone that had any piece of the Torah, he took it and he cut it up and he burned it, and then he killed the people over the burnt pile of the Torah and assassinated them. And the execution of anyone again possessing it. In verse 13, Daniel hears two angels speaking to one another as asking, how long will this go on? That phrase, how long? How long, O Lord? Is a very common phrase in Scripture, and I know you're familiar with it, from texts such as in, uh, in Isaiah or Jeremiah, Zechariah. Or repeatedly in the Psalms. By the way, if you have not gone to one of our Sunday school classes, Bruce Smith is teaching through the Psalms, and he is coming to one of the most important and exciting Psalms in the Scripture this Sunday with Psalm 110. This would be an excellent time for you to start attending Sunday school and come to Bruce's Psalms class to learn more about Psalm 110. Well, in verse 14, the answer is given. 2,300 evenings and mornings. This is the normal Hebrew idiom for a day. For the Hebrew day, which began at sunset and went through the night and the next day, an evening and a morning. And that that designed and designated a a Hebrew day. So each of the literal 24-hour days of creation, of the six days of creation. And there was evening, and there was morning, day one. And there was evening, and there was morning, day two. So in the 360-day Hebrew calendar, this would equate to six years and four and two-thirds months. All of this describes the exact timing of Scripture, and it all occurs during the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes and through his final destruction through the Maccabean Revolt. Dr. MacArthur notes the exact time frame from the conclusion of the Maccabean Revolt on December 25th in 164 BC. This is where there was the the inauguration of the Feast of Hanukkah, which means celebration. The Feast of Hanukkah is described in our New Testament. Did you know that? In John chapter 10 and verse 22, we see the Feast of Celebration described where Jesus is proclaiming His deity. It's a fantastic presentation. I went back and read it again this afternoon, and you need to do the same. John 10 and 22. But this is indeed the beginning of the end. And if we went from that date, December 25, 164, and we back up in the calendar, we get to the point where historians tell us was the first desecration of the temple by Antiochus IV Epiphanes. 2,300 days and nights. And again, this is indeed the beginning of the end. And we'll see much more of this fascinating discussion next week. But for now, we've already seen two facets that allude to the arrival of the end. 
And these events and this beginning, although prophetic to Daniel, are now historic to us. And we have such great specificity to see how these were brought together. And the end has begun. And the next steps are imminent. There is nothing standing in the way of the divine timetable for the next element towards the Lord's return, which will be the rapture of the church. And indeed, it has begun. So, beloved, may this make us more faithful. May it make us more desirous of holiness and the pursuit of understanding how we can better glorify our God and how we can better do the one thing that He calls us to do, which we will not be able to do in heaven, which is to carry forth the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the unsaved and dying world. Do that this week, beloved. Speak the name of Christ Open blind eyes, if God would so will through His Spirit, to bring them to a knowledge of Himself. Invite them to church. Join us on Saturday to go out and to hand out some tracts and invite people to church to talk about Christ. Join us on Sunday for the food pantry outreach. These are the ways that we prepare. These are the ways that we grow. These are the the baby steps that we take that make us more effective at sharing Christ. And if you find, no, because you find that you don't do the job that you should do in sharing Christ, nor do I, I will tell you that without these baby steps, you'll never start taking bigger ones. And there won't be a better opportunity than this. And beloved, the time is now. The darkness is growing ever greater. May the light of Christ shine through you because we are the A-team and Daniel's prophecy is coming to fruition. So let's be a part of that solution. Amen. Father, thank you for the understanding of all that you are doing. Dear Lord, how overwhelmed we are to understand how you give us such great detail. Father, to Daniel, many of these details were just ambiguous and hard or even impossible to understand. For us today, because of your grace and mercy and opening our eyes to Christ, we look back and we see such specificity. We see such beauty. We see such perfection in your word and therein in you. Lord, help us to honor you in that. Help us to be useful vessels fit for your kingdom. Vessels to receive the life-giving message of the water of life, the living water of your word through Jesus Christ. And Father, may we pour it out onto others. And may you, through the power of your spirit, use our efforts, weak as they may be, that you might receive the glory and honor. We love you and we thank you and we pray this all in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. God bless you all.